Okay, so we talked about value streams in general, but it turns out there are different kinds of value streams. There's no one right, there's no one right way to delineate these. Some people, they literally have dozens. Uh, I think the most popular delineation I've seen is like about 14. I do four. I'll explain that in a minute. The idea of where most people work and what I was showing you is what's called the development value stream. But as Alan Ward in a book years ago talked about how development value streams create what are called operational value streams. Okay, these are value streams for other people to use. So one is, of course, for the customer, the customer value streams. These are value streams that the customer uses to get value and to get the support they need for that value. Those are, so you don't have one customer value stream. Like if you're with a financial company, you might have one to, hey, check out the finances, the company. You might have another one to get a, to get uh, registered on it, another one to start an account or, you know, like a, a different kind of account, load money up, get money out. Those can all be different value streams, but they're all related to the customer getting value stream, including the support that they get. That's a customer value stream. Now I call operations value streams. I hate that operations and operational sound close, but I don't know what to do about it because I didn't come up with the word operational. That just means stuff that's being done and operations are in a company, they have operations. And that's what I mean, you know, uh, basically often setting up the infrastructure for the customer. And then what I call business enabling, like HR sales, marketing, things that enable the business. Now, a common misunderstanding, <laughs> I say common because I did it too for a very long time, uh, is besides these three operational value streams, again, Alan Ward was uh, Lean Product Development, I think was the book. Sometimes we misidentify what the business stakeholders doing when they're specifying success values, strategies, and all that. That's not part of any of these other value streams. That's a separate value stream. In a sense, it's actually a development value stream. This sound is a funny way to look at it, but if you start thinking about it this way, it gets very powerful. In other words, who's creating the strategies? Who's creating the initiatives? Basically, you don't think about this when something comes in. That's already been done. This here is creating the context for all of these. In other words, as you develop things for customers, you're looking at what customers am I interested in? Same thing with operations. How much money am I going to invest? So this is where maybe we set up the budgets, but this is where in, in the product, um, if we have a, a PMO or if we just don't, even if we just money comes in, how do we allocate it? So budgeting often happens here and the allocation happens here. But this is basically, in my mind, what I'd call development value stream. You have the customer, excuse me, you have the company, the, the business stakeholders, the board, the CEO, they talk amongst themselves. The company is the customer in this case. What are our strategies? What are our initiatives? And they figure this out and this sits there and then is used as the context for all these three. This isn't that important at this point, but it gets useful when we talk about how these pieces relate to each other. Um, okay, now, attending to value streams does provide more ways to manage them as well. In other words, uh, you know, they can align people. Uh, I've been harping on the notion that alignment's cheaper than coordination. In fact, coordination is the cost you have when you don't have alignment. The more people are aligned, the less coordination it takes. This is why taking, again, company uh, teams, we, we'll see this over and over and over again, that if you take teams and you combine them, then you have to coordinate them. But if you have a high view, like here, the stakeholders are providing a context for everything, you get alignment naturally and people work together. That's very important. Uh, seeing the needs of people in multiple value streams is useful because these do intertwine with each other. I didn't talk about that too much, but you're very familiar with that. Uh, seeing the relationships between the value streams is useful. So this is the main thing right here that I wanted to focus on is that we have development value streams, customer operations, and business enabling value streams. These three on the right are called operational value streams. The business stakeholders create the vision, the initiative for all of these. I want to spend a minute or two, though, on the customer value streams, because this is one of my serious pet peeves that uh, Agile has just not gotten better at, in my opinion. Yes, we focus on the customer, but what most companies do is they focus on how they make their systems work better for the customer. I'm going to say this again because this sounds right, but it's wrong. How do you make your system work better for the customer is the wrong way to look at it. 
what you want to do is look at how does the customer want to work and then how do I make my system support that? In other words, I focus on the customer and I build what I'm building to support the customer value stream. I don't have my system define the customer value stream. That's not the way they want to work. And you know this. You already know this. And here's how I know you know it. Because you had the experience of sometimes picking up a product. Maybe you had a couple of minutes to get used to it. But then it worked like it should work, like you thought it would work. That was natural for you. That's attending to the customer. But all too often, systems are built while there's, oh, how do I make the system better? And this is a problem because this is kind of how left brain people work uh, is oh, I'm logical and this is the way it should be. And you get a lot of this and you see a lot of customer support done while they just talk to you about how the system works. Now, the two examples I'm going to I'm going to. I'm going to mention two case studies, and then I'm going to actually show you a little bit more what's called the customer journey, because this is very important. So I never met the CEO of Morito, uh, uh, who invented the Sony Walkman, but I had an amazing business consulting back in the 80s. This is where I learned some of this stuff about customer value streams. We didn't call it that. We just said, what's the customer doing? What do they expect? I had been involved in um, uh, touchscreen technology back in 83. I built probably the first uh, super fully interactive touchscreen technology. This was back in uh, 84, actually. I was doing this for IBM. They needed a C programmer, a contractor. I, had, I fit the bill. And I rewrote one of their systems. And that's actually where I first started doing automated uh, acceptance test-driven development was on this project because I was one of these 10X programmers that wrote buggy code. <laughs> I was not doing tests first. I was just fixing my code after the fact because if you can find bugs quick, you can fix them quick. Uh, fixing bugs, here's a little nugget. Fixing is not where most programmers spend their time. It's finding the bug that they wrote a week ago that they have no idea what they did. I noticed this and I had my testing automated. I uh, had somebody run it and I went, oh, you know, how did I do that? Anyway, so what I learned in this and building this interactive touchscreen, it was at the Vancouver Expo 86. Um, it was like you'd walk into a kiosk, you touch the screen. Back in the day, we were using 14 inch Panasonic uh, discs. I can't call them DVDs, 14 inch wide. But anyway, I learned how to pay attention to customers from this and from some other work. And Morito actually analyzed and came up with the Walkman in an interesting way. He traveled a lot, he loved classical music. He could not play the classical music he liked while he was traveling. And the story is, I don't know this for a fact, but the story is he was at Rockefeller Center, some hotel there. I don't know if they have hotels there, but he's overlooking, he's overlooking Central Park in New York City. And he sees some people who are jogging. Okay. And they're just jogging, you know, however you jog, you're not carrying anything. Remember, this is back pre-Walkman. Okay. And he saw some people walking with boom boxes. <laughs> Most of you probably don't remember them, but the big things you'd carry on your shoulder playing the music. And, and it's, remember this is New York. So if you saw somebody running with a boom box, that's another story completely. But anyway, he noticed that the people who are running without music probably liked music. And the people who are walking with music, but without exercise, probably liked to exercise. And there was kind of a problem here. There was an opportunity. Nobody was asking for a Sony Walkman. But there was an opportunity here based on what the customers would like. See, so he's looking at the value streams of the customer, the customer journey in a sense. How are they health? How are they music? And how we can combine them. And the idea of the Sony Walkman hit him. What if we had a small tape player, not a recorder? Now, here's another interesting thing about this because supposedly he went back to his technical people and he said, look, I need a Sony player. I need a player. They didn't give him a player the first time out. They gave him a smaller tape recorder and they did this again and again. He kept, they kept getting smaller, but that wasn't what he wanted. He knew if they took out the recording stuff, if he knew if they took all that, they'd get it even smaller. And at some point he told them, the next time you come back with a smaller recorder, you're fired. I want the smallest player you can make. The lesson here, and that worked by the way, the lesson here is that sometimes again, Tech people are building systems. They like systems. So this is good, but you got to check that that's not necessarily what you want to do. Now, here was another case that I did. Uh, people always think this is funny. I'm not quite sure why. But in the, in the late 80s, uh, I was in the hair salon business. I was actually writing software for it. Uh, at one point, actually, I was bought by a salon distributing 
package because, I mean, a company that distributed hair salon products because they had an idea because both of us had studied dumbing and they knew I had it. And the idea was how could you make a salon package increase sales of products? He was he sold products, so he wanted to do that more than the software revenue. I built software, I wanted to sell that. And in fact, we ended up building a system that did this. Uh, I had built the hair salon package and then we added a report that showed people what their clients had done. Had, In other words, we were looking at the salon stylus, the way they worked. And we know what happens. You know, they, they, you sit down, you chat, you look at the services. The problem is the stylists don't like to be salespeople. We were working very high end. These were like artists. I'm an artist. I'm not a salesman. Attitude. So they didn't want to push products on people. We see, yeah, we get that. But what if you could give them better product? What if you emphasize how their hair will do better? You know, perms, uh, it's chemical process, colors, things like that. You, you need certain product, you really do. So we wrote a report that showed what people had done. And now this worked into both the stylist value stream, knowing how they talk to customers. It also looked at the customer value stream, how they take care of their, their hair. And what was really fascinating at before the report was put in the system, the average amount of retail sales per client of ours was 3% compared to salon sales. Like, I mean, stylist sales, you know, the coloring and all the services. Within two weeks after this report was put in place, that 3% jumped to 13% with virtually no training. The only training was, here's how you use this. In fact, I don't even know, we trained them. We, just, they just, we had to train the manager the salon manager to put the report that printed out automatically on the stylist. And it was of course done in the order that the clients were coming in by batched by the client. You can see that we organized it by the staff rather than in order the clients coming in by day. It was real easy to do. You know, computers can sort things really well. 3% to 13%. You can see why my partner was so happy. We basically quadrupled the sales of his, his staff by just writing one report. This illustrates a lot. It illustrates stuff like this goes in easier when you're paying attention to the customer. And it also shows about systems thinking, which I alluded to that the system affects you. Now there's another way to do this. And this is what I wanna talk about is what we call the customer journey. We wanna provide value to the customer by improving their experience. That's what he did in those other two examples. I got many other examples too. I've been designing this way since the late eighties. I learned it from some other people and some books I read that probably now out of date back then, but were interesting. Um, anyway, so the customer's operational value stream or the customer's, you know, as we talked about the customer's value stream goes in and out of our system. In other words, it's not just how they interact with our system. They do stuff in between as well. And the whole, from when they start doing something until they get value. Like if I get on, on a financial company again, uh, what I do, actually, I know there's going to be wait. So I figure out how to, what will entertain me here while I'm doing this. People are amazed how, how patient I am, uh, both the people out there and anybody who knew me before. Uh, but this is the customer journey, this path in and out. It's not just when they're touching the system. It's the whole thing. But this is the customer journey as it relates to our system. Now, here's a funny example. I don't have this model, but I do have a fridge like this. I've got a fridge for my garage. And what's interesting about this is you can see these extra doors. See, this can be closed and you can open this and pull out drinks without getting all the cold air of the fridge out. It's very convenient. It's also easier to stock. So the customer journey sometimes has nothing to do with what they're doing, but it lowers my electric bill. It makes it easier to stock the fridge. I love this thing. And I didn't, hadn't thought about it, but you're attending to what the customer journey was before I had this type of fridge. I'd have to open the whole thing. I'd lose all that cold air. I'd stock it. The bottles get in front of other bottles, hard to get to it. Whereas now I have this. This is an example of the customer journey. Okay, so what we learned, there are four different types of value streams, development, customer operations, business enabling. These three are called operational value streams. Uh, we saw strategies and vision create the context for all of these, and we can see the relationships between these in our work to aid our work in innovation.